We are joined by a uh, speaker for today, Professor Wang. Professor Wang is a professor in the School of Materials Science and Engineering at the Harbin Institute of Technology, located in Shenzhen, China. Professor Wang received his BS from Harbin Institute of Technology and his PhD in Chemistry from Penn State University under the supervision of Professor Thomas Moller. Dr. Wang's research laboratory works on experimental active colloids with interest in individual propulsion mechanisms, pairwise interactions, dynamics in complex environments, and collective behavior. A key mission is to understand and control active colloidal matter as well as emergent behaviors in complex systems. Thank you so much, Professor Wang, for joining us. The stage is now all yours. Thank you, Krishna, and really happy to have this opportunity to talk in ACS Science Talks, and I really appreciate ACS for organizing this wonderful event. And really, uh, thank you all for registering and for attending this. Okay, so uh, before I talk about active colloids, I want to briefly introduce the city, the place I work in. Uh, the city is called Shenzhen. It's located at the south southern point of China. It's actually right next to Hong Kong. And in Shenzhen, we have this HIT Shenzhen campus, which is actually just one campus of HIT family. It's a relatively young campus established about 20 years ago. And our group is even younger. We were established uh, roughly 10 years ago. Um, so right now we have about 15 lab members. And as Krishna introduced, our lab is focused on synthesizing, understanding, and controlling active colloids especially those powered by chemical reactions. And so just to give you a very brief introduction of colloids. Um, so here is a picture I took from the Sakana lab from NYU. It's a picture that shows a hair and some colloidal particles on the surface of the hair. So you can see the hair is about 50 to 100 micrometers thickness and colloidal particles is usually just nanometers or a few micrometers thick. And there are a lot of examples of colloids or colloidal suspensions in our everyday life. Uh, so milk, ink, paint, and blood, they're all examples of colloidal suspensions. Basically solid or uh, half solid particles suspended in some liquid. Uh, but in most of these cases, the colloidal particles are passive. So they're just undergoing some Brownian motion, which is typical for colloidal particles. However, uh, in my talk today, we'll be looking at active colloids, the colloidal particles that um, somehow take energy from the environment and convert that energy into autonomous motion. And beyond moving, these particles actually do a lot of interesting things. So here we show four videos that may maybe give you a taste of the kind of collective behaviors uh, we see for these active colloids. So my title is uh, chemical, chemically active colloids from one to many. So hopefully today I'll talk about some individual motion and then I'll transition to collective behaviors. And you saw uh, those active colloids, they move and they show collective behaviors. This falls into this topic of active matter. So I, I use this quote from Professor Eumanns from University of Oxford, who said active materials such as bacteria, molecular motors, and self-propelled colloids um, they take energy from the environment and use this to do work. And this concept, active matter, is really just a group of these self-propelled agents. And this active matter is becoming a very popular research area because of uh, a number of reasons. First, it's important for statistical physics because it, it gives this uh, testing ground for generating non-equilibrium statistical physics concept. And also active matter is really similar to the collective behavior you see from living creatures, such as cells, bacteria, birds, and fish. Finally, active matter is useful. Uh, we can take the concept, we can, we can be inspired by active matter and design nano machines or smart materials. And I've talked about active matter. I also talked about active colloids. I want to briefly introduce how they're related to each other. So if you think about all the matter, that active matter is a subset of all the matter. And in, usually uh, the examples are birds or fish that are uh, we see in the in nature. 
And then active colloid is active matter at a colloidal scale, at a nano or micrometer scale. And usually these uh, include bacteria or cells, uh, which not only move by themselves, but also exhibit some collective behaviors. Then um, among those active colloids, some are made by human. So synthetic active colloids, these uh, are the examples I'll be talking about today. So some of them are spheres, some of them are rods, and basically they are man-made colloidal particles that show, self, uh, show these individual propulsion and collective behaviors. There are a lot of shapes and sizes uh, people can design active colloids. And one reason why people like you and me to care about active colloid is because they're useful. And they're useful for sensing environmental applications, uh, microfabrication, and a major direction is to use them for biomedicine. And in these cases, you can think of active colloids as nanorobot or microrobot. So they're basically like a functional device or functional materials. And on the other hand, a lot of people, especially physicists, they are really interested in using active colloid as a model system to understand uh, complex systems, to understand how individual agents interact with each other and how that interaction gives rise to fascinating collective behavior, such as the bird flocking we see here. And there are a lot of aspects about active colloids, and it's really a, a multidisciplinary topic. Here, I'm listing a few that I personally use. Uh, so it touches on colloidal interface sciences, and because we need to make active colloids, so it, it's related to material science, and there are a lot of soft matter physicists use active colloids as a model system. And then we use ultrasound, we use light, we use electromagnetic fields to activate active colloids. We also control them. Finally, because people think active colloids as a robot, then it's related to mechanical engineering as well. And there are many ways to make a colloidal particle move. One category is by chemical reaction. And here we can use chemical reactions to generate bubbles, just like a jet plane. Or we can use chemical reaction to generate some local chemical gradient. And this, uh, then we have uh, some other mechanism that can drive these particles. We can also use external fields, such as electromagnetic field, ultrasound, and light. So here, this. Uh, active colloid is driven by an oscillating magnetic field, and this one is driven by megahertz ultrasound. So in my talk today, I'll be focusing on uh, active colloid driven by chemical reactions, and in, in particular, those driven by chemical gradients. And chemical, chemically active colloids um, is a special kind of active colloids. It has its unique features, unique challenges. So here uh, in the recent perspective article I published on JAX, uh, I talked about three key major uh, key questions that active colloid or chemically active colloid uh, research is facing. And But if we look at how these particles move, it starts with a chemical reaction, right? On the surface, some chemical reactant is being converted to product and this established some chemical gradient and this gradient causes the particle to move by a number of different mechanisms that I'm, I'm not going to talk about today. Then also because of this gradient, two moving particles can interact with each other through chemical interactions, through physical interactions. And then these interactions finally will give rise to collective behaviors. And during this whole process, we can ask, how does the motor, how, how does the active colloid move and how does it communicate? And also, how does this environment affect this particle dynamics at a both individual and a collective level? And if you think about this whole process, at the beginning, it's a molecular level thing, right? It's chemical reaction happening on the surface. And then at the end, the collective behavior, usually it's much larger scale. It can go even to millimeter scale or centimeter scale. 
Then a center question that my, my lab is really interested in is how does this chemical reaction occurring at a molecular scale lead to a macroscopic organization in space and time? So today I'll be talking about a, a one example of how we uh, look at a particular system, how we understand this process that goes from molecular level all the way to a large scale organization. And my lab um, is, so the research in my lab can be divided into these two axes. Along the horizontal axis, we have different kinds of active colloids uh, powered by different kinds of mechanisms. And the vertical axis is different kind of questions at, at a various level of complexity. And today we'll be looking at this particular um, set of question. And we focus on a particular kind of active colloids that is driven by some oscillating chemical reaction. And this series of work is a collaboration between my lab and also uh, Professor Zhang Hepeng's lab at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and also Professor Nobuhiko Suematsu at Meiji University in Japan. So we, we start by looking at some collective behaviors of natural active colloids, so the uh, uh, microorganisms. Here we have bacteria E. coli that are moving around and forming these rafts, and this is C. elegans forming a dynamic cluster. And this is um, a like a crystal formed by algae at an air-water interface. And finally, this is spiral waves seen in a group of modes. So in all these examples, we see dynamic behaviors and formed by interactions among individually moving active agents. And we can reproduce a lot of these observations in the lab by synthetic active colloids. And we've already seen these videos. This is a firework made of silver chloride microparticles. And this is uh, light responsive colloids forming dynamic crystals. And this is a shock wave uh, in the population of colloidal particles in electric fields. And this is active chains formed by individual colloidal particles also in electric fields. In, the, in these examples, we see that uh, we can very beautifully reproduce some of the spatial order or structures we see in space. But there's also something called temporal order we see often in nature. For example, in these cases, in the first case we see in a group of honeybee, the way they flap their wings, uh, it, it, it looks like a wave that's propagating through the entire population. And we saw this spiral wave from mold and the similar spiral wave can, can also be seen in heart when the heart is malfunctioning. And finally, in a population of firefly, uh, the, they flash, but they also flash in synchrony. So in all the, these examples, not only do they show some kind of spatial order, uh, in time, they show some periodic behaviors. And this kind of temporal order is not so common from synthetic active colloids. And about uh, 14 years ago, there's a paper published by the San Lab at Penn State University. They reported that uh, a particular kind of active colloids coated with silver, when you give it the right experimental condition, it can oscillate between a fast propulsion and then a very slow diffusion. And so then we, we took this system and we'll look at it more carefully. And the way we make them is by uh, coating some uniformly distributed microspheres half coated with, with the silver to make them into what we call a Janus particle. So this is what the particle looks like. And when you put this particle in a particular uh, solution, hydrogen peroxide plus some uh, potassium chloride, and when you shine UV light, this particle will move like this. So in this video, you can see the particle jumps, then stops for a little, then jumps again. And this kind of periodic motion, you can see from the speed diagram, uh, is entirely spontaneous because we don't 
all we do is supply the energy continuously and the particle somehow behaves intermittently. And this is really interesting. And we still don't know 100% why it oscillates, but we speculate also, um, Professor Sanslav also speculated uh, that one reaction is the oxidation of silver in hydrogen peroxide, as well as its photoreduction back into silver. And so these two reactions somehow oscillate back and forth. And note that the bottom reaction, the photoreduction of silver chloride is what we use for developing films when, when film is still, still a thing, right? So we speculate this, there's a chemical oscillation, but it's not very important for today's topic. And so the, we just talk about one individual at the coil, right? So it moves, uh, it, it jumps, then stops, and jumps and stops. But if you have many, many of these particles close to each other, and this is what happens. In, in, in this video, each one of these sphere is a genus particle. Uh, it's a polymer microsphere half coated with some silver. And you see that instead of moving back and forth, uh, the entire population show this wave behavior. So you see there's a wave propagating from the top to the bottom. And during the propagation of the wave, each particle is shifting its position a little bit, first um, upward, then downward. So this looks like a, a, a Mexican wave, which is the kind of human wave you see in a football stadium. So each particle, like a, like a little uh, human body here, it's not really moving far away, right? It's not, the wave is propagating, but the particle is not following the wave. It's doing, it's shifting a little bit in, in its local position, but the state, the motion, the state propagates downward. And uh, in addition to tracking individual particles, we can also uh, treat them like a, a fluid and do what we call a PIV tracking, a particle image velocimetry. Using this technique, basically we look at the entire video and see where things are shifting. And then we can map this video and, and by the degree of shifting or high uh, the speed of local shift. And you can see the wave propagates in the left video, it propagates outward in a concentric ring. In the right video, it propagates outward in a spiral. So both target waves and spiral waves are commonly seen in these colloidal waves, what we call a colloidal motion wave. Remember, each particle here, it's, um, it's a tiny, tiny three micrometer um, microsphere and we shine UV light on it. Each particle is undergoing some oscillating chemical reaction. And then collectively, they show this beautiful large scale wave. And here is a, a beautiful demonstration of this wave. So in this video, we removed all these particles. So the particles are still there, but we don't see them. We only see this PIV image. We see their speed profiles. So you can see these waves, they propagate, and they also collide with each other. And when they collide, the waves annihilate, the waves disappear. So then the question really is, what are the waves we see, right? To try to understand why we see waves. And the idea is this. So the wave we see, it's actually uh, two part. The first part, there's a traveling chemical wave that we cannot see, right? Because it's a chemical wave. Uh, so it's invisible to human, human eyes. But then because we have all these colloidal particles in the suspension, they respond to the chemical wave, to the chemical gradient, and then they move back and forth. Essentially, they serve like a tracer and we can see the tracer moving. And that's how we, we know there's a chemical wave that's propagating. So then the, 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 the key point to confirm this hypothesis is to see whether we have a chemical wave. And to do this, to do this uh, we were very lucky to pick a uh, very appropriate sensor. 
It's a pH sensitive fluorescent dye. So this dye molecule called solvent green seven uh, takes blue light and then emits green light. And the beautiful thing is the intensity of the emitted green light is related to the local pH value. So at a high pH, it's more bright. At low pH, it's more dim. Then we, we put this fluorescent dye, we mix it with all these chloral particles and we shine UV light, we, we have all these chemicals and then the particles show motion wave, right? But at the same time, we can track the fluorescent and we see the fluorescent, uh, the color or the intensity of the fluorescent also propagates like a wave. And when you, when you overlap, when you overlap the particle, particles motion with the fluorescent, you can see at the wavefront, it's more bright, which means at the wavefront, it's high pH. So this video, this result confirmed that we have a traveling chemical wave um, of OH minus. So after we confirm there's a chemical wave, we wanna understand why there's a chemical wave. And to do that, we collaborate with Professor Zhang Hepeng and his student Xu Yankai. And they took a very generic uh, reaction diffusion model called rogers mcculloch model. And, and I think this model was originally developed to understand heart. And so in this model, there are two equations that describe the, uh, the evolution of a concentration of one activator and one inhibitor. So in this, in, in, in the activator equation, the activator species, it diffuses and also builds up really, really fast. And on the other hand, it gets consumed and the consumption rate is related to this inhibitor. So if you solve these uh, partial differential equation, you get this peak. So you basically get a concentration profile. And if you solve it in both space and time, then you reproduce this chemical wave, this chemical peak that's propagating in space. So basically uh, these results say that uh, we have a numerical, numerical model based on reaction diffusion that can reproduce this kind of chemical wave we see in the lab. Uh, although we don't understand what acti activator and what inhibitor is in our uh, experiment. Uh, so this result shows we probably have a reaction diffusion system and the wave we see is a result of that reaction diffusion. And not only does the model um, generate wave, it generate wave that semi-quantitatively agree with our experiments. So for example, the wave speed and the way the two waves annihilate and also um, the way uh, the two waves can be generated subsequently. All these can be reproduced by that reaction diffusion model. So, uh, these results show we indeed have a chemical wave and we, we, we have good reason to speculate the chemical wave is because of some chemical uh, reaction and diffusion process. And then the last piece of puzzle is why do the particle move? Here I say the chloral particles are responding to the chemical wave, but exactly what kind of response is that? I can't go into too much detail because of time, but basically when we have a tra traveling chemical wave, we have um, two slopes, right? At the wave front and the wave back. Here at the two slopes, uh, two steep slopes, we have a very big chemical gradient. And these gradients, when they couple to a bottom substrate, because all these particles are uh, close to a bottom surface, which is usually made of glass. And when you have a gradient, when they couple to a bottom surface, they generate some flow. And in this case, it's called diffuso osmotic flow. Sorry, I can't in go into detail, but just imagine whenever a wave propagates at these parts, there's a flow. And because we have particles, these particles are basically being flushed by the flows. So at, at this uh, point, it's being pulled forward. At this point, it's being pushed backward. So now we can imagine as the wave propagates, these particles will be pushed 
forward and then backward. So they go back and forth. And that's exactly what we see in experiment, like this, right? So imagine there's a wave, there's a flow that's moving forward and each particle is being flushed back and forth. And this is similar to, uh, uh, superficially, similar to what you see here in a, in a sea park, when they generate these artificial waves, all these people are being flushed back and forth. Okay, so the next thing we wonder is, can we control these waves? In the pre previous videos, uh, we saw that these waves are like target waves or spiral waves. They seem to originate from random positions and they move into random position. And then they annihilate at random positions and they move at random speeds, right? So I, everything seems pretty random, but actually we can control them because these particles or these chemical reactions are initiated by light. They're initiated by photochemical reactions. So we can control where light is applied by something called structured light technology. It's basically just a, a fancy projector. So a projector project light at the specific places at a specific speed. Uh, so you can turn light on and off. And then we, we, we basically build a structured light uh, microscope and focus those light spots onto our sample. And by that, we can control when and where a wave starts and the path it goes and the direction it goes, even the shape and the speed of these waves. So we have really good control of the caudal motion wave you just saw. Okay, I think then I can have a quick summary of what I um, this this story, right? So in the first part, we talked about single particle oscillation. Uh, this is a polymer sphere half coated with sewer. It's about a few micrometers big, and we put it in hydrogen peroxide, potassium chloride, and we shine UV light. And this particle will spontaneously oscillate in speed. So it will stay sort of inert for a while, then it jumps really, really fast, and it go back to this inert phase. And so this is single particle dynamics. If you have a lot of particles together, they will chemically communicate with each other. So I, I didn't talk about this communication, but each particle's oscillating chemical reaction will affect others. So the, eventually they will synchronize, and then you will see this huge motion wave propagating through the entire population. And this motion wave we mentioned is because there's a chemical wave. The chemical wave propagates and causes some local flow and local flow flushes the particle back and forth. And if we want to control the wave, we can build a structured light uh, setup. We can control where the light is applied and how fast we turn the light on and off. And that in that way, we can control where the wave starts, how fast it goes, et cetera, et cetera. So here I'm showing a interesting video where we basically use the particles, use the wave to draw a small rocket. So uh, I basically just talked about two individual research papers, but there's a lot more uh, than those two stories about this oscillating colloid. So uh, if we look at the horizontal axis, we can look at this system from a dilute extreme. So just one particle, that's the, uh, that's the story we just talked about, all the way to a, a very, very dense population. That's the other story we talked about, the colloidal wave. But there's actually a lot of things going on in between. So at an intermediate density, there are actually two kinds of waves that switch between uh, one to the other as the density increases. And then this is all about understanding what's going on. But in terms of controlling the individual and collective behaviors, uh, we also developed a lot of ways, mostly uh, about uh, using the light as a, as a toggle, right? So we can control the light frequency. We can control how, how, how fast we turn the light on and off. We can control where the light is applied. We can also control the particle density. And more recently, we saw that if you have a very dense population, in addition to these waves we've talked about, 
these particles actually spontaneously uh, they separate into these islands or sometimes labyrinth structures. And what's funny is when these particles form these structures, the wave is still there, but the wave is confined to these islands because you know if you don't have any particle, there's nothing to, to, to show the wave, right? So these islands or these labyrinth patterns, they will also um, expand and contract like a wave. So in this example, we have both space organization because you have pattern and also temporal organization because you have oscillation. So this is a very interesting example we recently published. Now you might be wondering up here after hearing all these stories, uh, what's the point of understanding and controlling these particles, uh, especially the waves, right? Other than looking interesting, what's the, whether it's useful or not. So if you think about this, uh, these examples in nature, whether in ants or microorganisms or in cells, we see that a lot of them have a way of communicating with each other through chemicals, right? So this is, this is all demonstration of chemical communications in nature. Now, uh, if we really want to use robots, in human body or in complex environment, we need to find a way for them to communicate. And the way we do it right now is mostly through electromagnetic waves, right? So each robot has antenna and it can generate, it can transmit signal, it can receive signal. But if you make the robot really, really small, it will be increasingly difficult to put the antenna on a nano robot. Then we have to find a different way for them to communicate, for them to coordinate, right? If you, uh, if you're thinking about a very complex task, very complex mission, all these individual robots have to coordinate. So maybe the wave we just saw is a, a efficient way for these chemical nano robots to communicate with each other. And imagine these robots sends out a chemical signal, and that signal transmit to other robot, and then transmit even further then all these robots will become synchronized and they collectively do something. So that's the vision. All right, so finally, I wanna uh, briefly summarize the idea of active colloid. I wanna uh, show this diagram again. So if we look at, if we think about all the matter in the world, uh, we have hard condensed matter, right? Semiconductors, steel, um, even plastics. And then we have soft matter, uh, which is which has weak interactions among the constituent units, molecules, uh, liquid crystals, etc. So here, colloid is one very typical example of soft matter. And then actin matter is uh, the kind of matter that constantly take energy from the environment and show some interesting collective behaviors. And then we have actin colloid, which is actin matter at a colloidal scale. Sorry, it's a, the presentation is a little frozen. Then active colloid is active matter at a colloidal scale. And these include bacteria, algae, cells, and enzyme. And then finally, the, the topic of this talk is about synthetic active colloids. And they're also called micromotors or nanomotors and synthetic microswimmers or even micro robots depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to material chemists, maybe they use motors more. If you're talking about talking to engineers, they probably think of as micro robot. But either way, these active colloids are good for two reasons. They are good model systems to understand and control active matter or complex systems. They're also machines. So you can use them in biomedicine or sensing applications. And so, in today's talk, we mostly focused on self-organization. But my lab is really, uh, my lab uh, is interesting all kinds of questions about chemically active colloids. Uh, for example, we recently published a few papers that looked at the detail of their cell propulsion. And we studied how the environment affect their speed. In particular, in this paper, very, very recently, we discovered that uh, chemically active colloids move really, really fast on oil-water interface. So this is really surprising. 
And uh, we, we think it's because chemical reactions happen faster at the oil water interface. And then we also looked at how two um, chemically active colloids interact with each other. So the pair pairwise pair -wise interactions. Okay, so before I finish, uh, there's a quick advertisement. Like Krishna was saying, ACS is uh, organizing a number of virtual symposium for the ACS fall meeting in 2024. And I think it uh, ACS has five and there's one called Chemical Nanomotor Frontiers and Opportunities. And uh, we have two chairs. One is Professor Maiti from uh, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. And the other one is me. So we're organizing this symposium to commemorate uh, this really seminal paper that was published 20 years ago that started the whole field of chemical nanomotors. And for, uh, to, today it has over 2000 citations. And this symposium is completely virtual, completely online. So everybody can join. And we have four sessions. Uh, three sessions about motion control, collective behaviors, and applications of chemical nanomotors. And there's another session on living nanomotors, enzymes, bacteria, et cetera. And we have a great lineup of speakers. Uh, we have nine plenary speakers and eight invited speakers. All are leading experts in this field and all have had a lasting impact in this research area. And we really encourage early career researchers uh, grad students, postdoc, to present their research. Um, we have 10 minute flash talk for, the, for them to give presentations. And we have a submission deadline that is April the 1st. All right, with that, I'd like to thank my funding agencies, National Science Foundation of China, and also the Guangdong and Shenzhen governments to fund my research and all the very, very good, very hardworking lab members in my lab. Thank you very much.